In April of 2022, last year, April last year, I went to a conference out in California that was all about discipleship. It's called Cal Seminar, California Seminar. Cal Seminar, and it's, uh, it was a conference that was done in uh, Korean fully. Uh, and I was among uh, 40-some uh, Korean, fully Korean first-gen pastors who are doing Korean ministry throughout the country. And I was one of the handful of English ministers uh, there. The majority of the time that I was at this conference, which was about four days long, this conference was focused on helping pastors run a discipleship training program for their congregation members, wherever they served. And these congregation members for this discipleship training program, they would devote 38 weeks, right? Basically a whole year to doing discipleship, okay? Every day doing devotional, about 15 minutes long. This is the program. Every week doing at least one devotional uh, that is about two hours long. Every week for 38 weeks, memorizing different verses of the Bible. Every week sitting in the front row, the front row seats of the chapel and uh, taking meticulous sermon notes. I think that's funny because today out of every week, there's no one in the front seat. And of course, every week, usually on a Wednesday evening, sitting in class, right, discipleship training class for about three hours, studying the Bible and learning more about these different aspects of Christian life. In the program that they were teaching and, and running this discipleship 38-week program, one absence would mean that you get a one-on-one -on -one supplemental class with the teaching pastor. And, of course, this was meant to uh, be an unpleasant time, right, to discourage you from missing class. And then, uh, and that's because uh, the second absence would mean that you would fail that discipleship training course, the second absence. And you would have to start over the 38 weeks again the next year. In the churches that have adopted this system of discipleship, these 38 weeks of training, it was mandatory uh, for those who wanted to become leaders in the church or ordained deacons, as we say, or or deaconess, or eventually elders. These 38 weeks of training were mandatory prerequisites for these church leaders. In the churches that adopted this system, this, these uh, 38 weeks of training was just part two of the total three uh, training courses. Part one is uh, a 16-week course. Uh, much like the one-on-one -on -one that we do here at Cross. And then after graduating from the 38 weeks, there's another six months of ministry training for these individuals who are to be church leaders. So at this conference through the four days, they were telling me that there are churches out there that require their lay leaders, right, just everyday normal people like you, to devote almost two whole years, two whole years of discipleship training, during which no, not, no one can really go on vacation because you can't miss more than one time. During which, during those two years, they're so busy studying the Bible, so busy memorizing the Bible, so busy doing devotionals, that these people, they actually do not have the time to serve in any other aspect of church. For those two years, those uh, students or those uh, trainees are taken out from praise team, welcoming team, from uh, community leaders. For two years, they just focus on training, discipleship. 
And the cherry on top is that at the end of the two years, it is a mandatory requirement that all those graduates go on a short-term missions trip in the summer. Just listening to that is kind of tiring, isn't it? There's so much to do. It might even be burdensome to you, some of you, who, who really don't want me to adopt this system. This, what they were telling me, teaching me, it really did intrigue me. Because, to be honest, KCQ, our church, is one of those churches. We have adopted this system, and we have been working with this system for the last four years. There's the 16 weeks of one-on-one over in the KM. There's the 38 weeks of discipleship. And then after that, if you are elected as an elder or an ordained deacon or a deaconess, there is another six months of ministry training. We actually do this here at KCQ, to a certain degree at least. And to a certain degree, it has worked. And so, as I was sitting at this conference, I started to wonder, right? I started to wonder, what about cross ministries. What about the EM, right? What about us, right? To me, in my heart, I believe fully, 100%, that we are, the tr- we are the future of KCQ. What kind of discipleship, how could I apply what I was learning last year to this ministry? And it's important that I wondered that, right? Because there must be people here in front of me. There must be people here, one of you, individuals that want to be a disciple of Jesus, right? Anyone? (laughs) Anyone want to be a disciple of Jesus? All right, you're signed up. I'm just kidding. I wonder if Jesus walked into this room and he asked, do you want to be my disciple? How many of you would say yes? How many of you would follow him? I hope all of us. I really do. But as I was sitting at that conference through the four days I was there, I started to ask around. You know, I started to ask uh, these uh, first-generation KM pastors, at your church are the second generation, are your children also taking part of the discipleship training? Are your children also taking part of the 38 weeks of, of this intense course? Are they willing to go the 38 weeks or the six months afterwards? Are any of your second generation members, have they been elected as deacons or elders? How many English ministries are doing discipleship training? Or at least in this way. I know many churches are, but in this way, in this intense 38 week plus another two whole years of discipleship training. Surprisingly, the answer that I got, or maybe it's not surprising, was no way. There is no English ministry. There is no second generation church. No church of young Korean Americans or young Asian Americans. No churches, no young people of God who are willing to commit 38 weeks of their life to discipleship training course. They told me it, didn't, it doesn't work. The culture is different. So I was honestly pretty discouraged. Four, four days of sitting there uh, translating in my head all these Korean words, right? I was like, what am I doing? You know, what, what, what am I here for if the second generation or English ministries, they don't want this discipleship training? And then... One of the speakers at that conference, one of them, who was a pretty big deal in Korea, he showed me a small glimmer of hope. 
This speaker, he asked, he asked, what is an everyday person's standard of discipleship? What is an everyday person's standard of being a disciple of Jesus? Because that's really important, right? A discipleship training course is meant for congregation members to become a disciple of Jesus. So to a, dis to a member of the congregation, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus to you? That speaker, he presented a couple questions. He said, in your opinion, right, and I'm asking you, in your opinion, in your mind, a disciple of Jesus, a true disciple of Jesus, how many times, how many times a disciple of Jesus, how many times a week do they do quiet time? How many times? Per week, out of seven days, how many times would a disciple of Jesus do QT? Seven? <laughs> that would be ideal, isn't it? But that speaker said, no, that's not realistic. Not many people can do seven QTs in a week. So maybe five. Or if that's a reach, how about four? Three times per week, that's, that's less than half the week. Right? A disciple of Jesus, in your mind, what do you think? You can disagree with me. A disciple of Jesus should do at least four times a week, right? More than half at least a week. What about, what about evangelism? A disciple of Jesus, right? The standard is that you're a disciple of Jesus, not a churchgoer. A disciple of Jesus, how many times out of the whole year, 52 weeks, how many times should a disciple bring a non-believer to church? A stranger or a friend who doesn't believe, how many times? Once? Once in one year should a disciple bring a friend to church? Or maybe twice? To me, what he showed me was that there is a realistic way for all of us, no matter the language nor the culture, for us to realistically, practically think about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Right? You can apply that to your life, right? I want to be a disciple of Jesus. So, you know what? This week... To be a disciple of Jesus, I think I should at least do three devotionals, right? Or four devotionals. Or as a disciple of Jesus, I think at least I should maybe do something to serve in the church. Or maybe I should text my friends a Bible verse as a disciple of Jesus. Whatever standard of a disciple of Jesus it might be to you, you can apply that into your life, right? So I got that from that conference. We can actually think about being a disciple of Jesus in a practical way. And so, getting into our text today, I want you to take a moment in the next 20 minutes or so to think practically, realistically, about being a disciple of Jesus. And if, if you, for today, according to your own opinion of what a disciple of Jesus should be, if you are not yet a disciple of Jesus, I want to encourage you. I want to work on it with you. Let's help and support each other uh, as we take our first steps of becoming Jesus' disciple. If by the standards that you are thinking about in your head, a disciple should do four devotionals or bring three members to church, whatever it is. If you are not yet a disciple of Jesus meeting that standard, let's work on that together. Let's think during this time practically, realistically, what it means for us to be a disciple of Jesus.
Verse 35 through 37, it says, The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Here in John chapter 1, Jesus gains his first disciples. The first two disciples. The first of uh, whom? Which? is Andrew, okay? And Andrew says in our passage that he is, who's but, his, who's brother? <laughs> brother. Who's brother? Simon Peters, thank you. I'm glad you were, we're on the same page right now. Yeah, Andrew, okay? Andrew is one of the two, but the, the, the second one is not yet Peter. The second one is an unnamed disciple in the Gospel of John who we know is the beloved disciple or the evangelist or John, John himself, the one that is writing. So the first two disciples, Andrew and John, they heard from John the Baptist saying, behold, the Lamb of God. And so these two disciples of John the Baptist, Andrew and John, it's kind of confusing, they have the same name. Andrew and John who are disciples of John the Baptist, left John the Baptist and start, they started following Jesus. These two disciples, they're not abandoning John the Baptist. Rather, the message of John, right, John the Baptist, his message, if they understood it clearly, knowing that John the Baptist is the one calling in the, in the, in the wild, preparing the way for the Messiah, John's true disciples would have, when John says, Behold the Lamb of God, would have left John and followed Jesus. And so John the Baptist evidently had two true disciples who actually understood what he was saying. So when John says, John who was preparing the way of the Messiah, when he says, He's the one that I've been preparing the way for, his true disciples, Andrew and the evangelist. Andrew and the beloved disciple whose name is John, the one that's writing our text today. Those two, they followed Jesus. That's what it says, right? Verse 37, the two disciples heard John the Baptist say this and they followed Jesus. This word followed is very important for us. If you have noticed the Sermon series, this sermon series, which is going to be like 30-some weeks long, the sermon series is titled, Follow Me and Believe. Follow Me and Believe. So this word follow, very important. This is the beginning of their discipleship for these two, this, two, uh, two disciples, Andrew and John. They leave behind John the Baptist, taking his, his teaching, and they start following Jesus as Jesus' disciples. John is using verse 37 and using uh, really uh, using himself as an example uh, to introduce us to this important word, to follow. In the Greek dictionary, this word to follow means to move behind someone in the same direction. To follow someone is to move behind someone in the same direction. <laughs> and you're like, obviously. Or, secondly, to comply with or to obey someone, right? To follow someone. But in the Gospel of John, this specific definition is what we should apply every time or most of the time. In the Gospel of John, this word, to follow, specifically means to follow someone as a disciple. So Andrew and John, they were once following John the Baptist, but when John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God, John the Baptist is no longer who they follow. Rather, they are now following as a disciple, Jesus. You see this actually throughout the Gospel of John. In John chapter 8, verse 12, it says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 
as we are following Jesus, Jesus saying, whoever is my disciple will not walk in the darkness, but have the light of life. John chapter 3, verse 19, this is what Jesus said before. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because of their works. To follow Jesus in the light of these two passages, these two verses, to follow Jesus means that his disciples are set apart from the darkness in this world. Rather, um, or to go one step forward, uh, it, to follow Jesus means that his disciples, they do not walk in the darkness as with the rest of the world, but we walk in the light apart from the world. To, have, to follow Jesus is to have the light of life within us. Brothers and sisters, to follow Jesus, we have to be different. We can't just follow the patterns of this world. We need to be walking in the light, being renewed by the Spirit every day. John chapter 12, uh, 26, Jesus, follow, uh, Jesus uses the word follow once again. He says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. To follow Jesus is to hold Jesus as our master. To serve him and him alone. We cannot have two masters. It's to serve Jesus and Jesus alone. To leave behind the world, the darkness in the world, to follow the light of the world. Verse 20, uh, John 21, verse 22. Jesus says to him, said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. The same word follow, to follow Jesus as a disciple means that we do not worry about what Jesus is doing or what God is doing or his will. We just follow his will. We take Jesus we take God as the sovereign Lord, our master, and we actually do obey, comply, move in the same direction with him. That's what it means in the Gospel of John to follow Jesus as a disciple. In verse 38, Jesus turned as he saw them following and said to him, said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? I think John here, he wants those of us who are reading the text, not just uh, to show, give us information about what Andrew and John, John himself did, but I think the, uh, the evangelist, the, the writer of this text, they want us to reflect on this question. The Messiah, the Logos, the Word became flesh. He's asking you, as you are beginning your discipleship to him, he's asking you, what are you seeking? Jesus is asking us, what are you seeking? As you follow me, what are you seeking? As you take your first steps, he's asking, what are you seeking? And that's important, right? It's important because you can't become a uh, disciple of Jesus for fame. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. We have clear examples in the Bible too. In Matthew 19, we see a rich young man. He followed Jesus. He wanted to be a disciple of Jesus. In Matthew 19, 16, it says, And behold, a man came up to him, the rich young man, saying, Teacher, same thing, right? Rabbi, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And then Jesus explains, 
if you would enter life, keep the commandments. And then he, he explains just the Ten Commandments. And then in Matthew 19, verse 21 and 22, Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Follow me as a disciple after you go and sell what you possess and give to the poor. Because if you follow me, you'll have treasure in heaven. But verse 22, as we all know, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This young man, he came to Jesus to follow Jesus as a disciple. And Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, give up everything you have in this world. Go and sell what you possess. Give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And then follow me. But what we see is that he didn't want to give up the world. To him, he wanted the world and Jesus. He wanted to serve two masters. But we cannot serve two masters. Judas Iscariot followed Jesus. For years, Judas Iscariot, he was following Jesus, but what he was seeking was personal gain. He wasn't seeking to be a true disciple of Jesus, but he was seeking personal gain. He didn't realize what Jesus was offering, that, it was offer, yeah, that he was offering eternal life, forgiveness of sin, reconciliation with God. Instead, he betrayed the Savior of the world, for 40 pieces of silver. What are you seeking? This is what Andrew found when he went with Jesus. In verse 40 and 41 it says, One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the... Messiah, which means Christ. Andrew, Andrew goes to his brother, right, Simon Peter. Andrew shares this good news. Peter, I have found the Savior. I have found Christ. I have found the one that the prophecy is talked about. I have found the one that John the Baptist has been preparing the way for. Andrew, in this moment, becomes the first person to discover that the most common and effective Christian testimony is the private witness of a friend to another friend. Brother to a brother. Andrew, he takes the good news of Jesus Christ, he takes it to his brother. He, he found out that's the most effective way. Bring your brother, bring your sister, bring your friend to Christ. That was the first effect that he saw in his life as a disciple of Jesus. What was the message that Andrew shared to Peter? He went to Peter and he said... I have found in the Hebrew what is called Yava Meshio. Yava Meshio. Literally translated, the Lord's anointed. I have found the Lord's anointed. The one who is anointed by Yahweh. Yava, right? Yahweh, the one. The, the I am God, he anointed this guy. This is the Christ, the Messiah that we have been li- uh, waiting for. The Lord's anointed one. The one who is set apart by God. The anointed prophet. The anointed prophet, I found him. The anointed priest, 
I found him here, the anointed king, that Messiah, I found him. Messiah in the Old Testament It literally, it means anointed, right? And so they could, uh, when, when in the Old Testament, when we talk about how uh, King David was anointed as king of Israel, the verb that is used is Messiah or Meshiel, right? David was Messiahed, right? Anointed or Aaron, the, the first high priest, he was Mashiach or Messiah, right? Anointed by the Lord to become priest. Elisha, when he was appointed as a prophet, he was Messiah, anointed by the Lord. In the New Testament here, Andrew, as he goes to his brother Peter, he says, I found this anointed one. Yava Meshio. And here I want to share with you as I, yeah, as I close, what does it mean that Christ is our Messiah? What does it mean that Christ is the anointed one? That he is our Redeemer, that he is our Savior, that he is Christ. And to this, I want to introduce you to something that you probably don't look at very often. Um, this is called the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Those of you who have been, uh, who, who took the baptism confirmation class with me at church, uh, at Cross Ministries, you probably took a look with me briefly. But this is just four questions and answers through which we know what it means that our God, our Jesus, the Word became flesh what it means that he is our Messiah. This is the 23rd question in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Is that easy enough for you to see clearly? I hope so. Yeah. As it goes, 23, the, the question is written at the top, and the answer is on the bottom. And... This is church tradition, the Protestant Reformed Church tradition, for me to read the question and for you to respond by reading the answer. So let's try. What offices does Christ execute as our Redeemer? Christ, our Redeemer, executes. Amen. Christ is our Redeemer, our Messiah, executes the office of three different uh, roles. One, prophet, two, priest, and three, king. These are the three roles in the Old Testament that were anointed by the Lord. So, for uh, question 24, how does Christ execute the office of a prophet Read for us. Or prophet in revealing to us by his word and his spirit the will of God for our salvation. As a prophet, Jesus has come to proclaim the good news to us. As prophets did in the Old Testament, receiving word from God and sharing with the people, that's what Christ does as our prophet. This is Luke chapter 4, verse 18. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, Mashiach me, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. And recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. As the prophet, the prophet, Jesus has come to proclaim the good news to us. To proclaim freedom to the captives of sin. When you follow Jesus, you need to know that we are following the anointed prophet. 
the Messiah who proclaimed to us the good news. And we move in the same direction with him as a disciple in doing what? Proclaiming that same good news to our neighbors, to our brothers and sisters, and most effectively to our friend. Question 25, how does Christ execute the office of a priest? Christ executes the office of a priest. Read with me. In his once offering up of himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconcile to us, us to God, and in making continual intercession for us. As priest, Jesus guarantees our salvation. We see this in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22 to 25. I'll just read it very quickly for us. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently, Jesus does, because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. As, as our priest, the anointed priest, Jesus guarantees our salvation, the forgiveness of sin, the reconciliation between God and man forever through his own blood spilt on the cross. The perfect anointed priest who also was the perfect atoning sacrifice for sins. When you follow Jesus, when you are a disciple of Jesus, you need to know that you are following the anointed, forever permanent priest. That we also must be willing to sacrifice ourselves for the salvation of many others. Question 26. How does Christ execute the office of a king? Christ executes the office of a king, read with me, in subduing us to himself, in ruling, in defending us, and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. As king, the king, Jesus, defends us, rules over us. He is sovereign over us. John 16, 33 he says, I have said these things to you. Jesus is talking here. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. As a king, the king, the anointed king, our Lord Jesus defends us. He rules over us. He is sovereign over us because... And because our king has overcome the world, we live in peace, in hope, in strength. Knowing that if God is for us, who could stand against? Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to urge you today. I want to take you back to this place where we can think practically and realistically about becoming a disciple of Jesus. Jesus is asking you, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? If your answer is, Lord, I want to be your disciple. I want to follow you. I want to move in the same direction as you. I want to know that you are my Messiah, the anointed prophet, priest, and king. Jesus' answer to you is come and you will see. Come and you will see. Take your first steps. This is just the beginning. Come and you will see. And you will see greater things than these. Will you be a disciple of the Messiah, the anointed one today? Are you seeking to be a disciple of the Messiah, the prophet Jesus, the priest Jesus, the king Jesus? What are you seeking today? Are you seeking fame, security, hope, joy, peace? It is all found in Jesus Christ. I want to urge you to take your first steps or your fifth step or your 20th 
step, practically, realistically, of following Jesus. Whatever it is, whatever it is that you can do to be a better disciple of Jesus, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would apply that practically, realistically into your life. How do we follow Jesus? First, we got to go where Jesus is. And that's in the word, in your daily devotional, in your daily Bible. Let's follow Jesus. Let's pray.